Thank you very much, and good morning. It's an honor to be here. Um, because of the work that I do, there were many directions that this particular presentation could have taken. Uh, the one that I chose, I hope is the right one, but I, I will be open for questions for a lot of the work that we're doing. So my pre presentation begins, I believe, where we all are, are already. What's this? Okay, and this is where we all are. Uh, there's now overwhelming scientific evidence that climate change is real, in spite of the fact that some of our politicians in this country don't believe so, and that it poses a serious global threat that cannot be ignored. Okay, um, to back this up, of course, we have the International Panel on Climate Change, which basically predicts further warming of the climate system, and it basically tells us that we could, can expect global climate changes in the future. And that is regardless of what our mitigations are at this point, we can expect uh, these changes to occur. When we look at increase, we can expect increases in impacts. And these are just, this is a short list of some of the ones that we can expect, increased flooding, higher mean at atmospheric temperatures, higher global mean sea level, increased precipitation, increased droughts, increased atmospheric moisture holding capacity, increased heat waves, increased strength of storms. It almost sounds like our commercials about drugs. You know, there's a ph pharmaceutical company selling a drug and it's supposed to be good for your health, but when they finish, they tell you all of the side effects, which sounds worse than the disease. Uh, this is about the way I feel when I begin listing uh, the impacts of climate change, and the list goes on. More energetic waves, storm surges that reach further inland, under capacity of urban sewerage and drainage systems, increased blight, increased vulnerability of port cities, which is where we are, and disproportionate impacts on disadvantaged population segments. This is the part of the, the particular um, impact that we hear little about, but it is the one that I work most closely with. Um, to give you just some, some statistics that absolutely affect those of us who live here, when we look at uh, 2010 Atlantic hurricane season, and we find that it was the third most active season on record, tying with 1887, 1995, and then, of course, 2011, which was a god-awful hurricane year for most of us who live here. But when we look around the world, and I know this is an international conference, so I know I'm not speaking to everyone, but to give us a feel of what's going on around the world, we had an earthquake in, in Haiti. It was the most powerful to hit Haiti in a century. And it left about 200,000 people dead. Earthquakes in Chile. Um, it was a 8.8 uh, .8 magnitude earthquake. It was also one of the largest ever recorded. Then we began to see flooding in France. So you know very quickly that this is not a local phenomenon. It is in fact a global one. And of course the 2011 Atlantic hurricane season produced a total of 19 tropical storms. And this was of course what Noah predicted. Uh, thank God they're predicting less of that this year although you can't tell by the weather, but we're supposed to have fewer hurricanes this season than what we did in 2011. And so societies have always had to manage weather, the Im weather impacts. Wherever you live, there's always something, be it earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes, um, forest fires, there's always something that we have to uh, manage. But the problem is that there's always a question of equity. In other words, in our managing of our climate uh, impacts, who will benefit from, from the different um, um, tactics or techniques that we put in place to mitigate that problem? We already know that some of the things that we did with the Mississippi River is now affecting us today. We were trying to save flooding of people upriver and it's caused all kinds of problems for those who, of us who live downriver. So who determines what groups will benefit 
from whatever it is we decide to do to mitigate some of the problems related to weather. Well, we do know that disadvantaged populations around the world already bear inequitable environmental burdens. And this is our big problem now. There is actually inadequate knowledge of what new disproportionate impacts will emerge under climate change. We know what we know, but we also don't know what we don't know. And living in this society, as every day we live, we find out there's something out else that may be affecting our health that we thought at one time was safe. Asbestos is probably the best example. But there are many more, and we have no idea what we will find in the future. And so the differential effects of weather disasters are consistent with a pervasive continuum in which low-income and minority communities suffer from both higher socioeconomic stress and greater environmental exposure to toxins, hazardous waste, and other environmental burdens. Such was the case in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina and Rita, and of course after BP. I took the BP slides off because I only had 10 minutes. Um, and so when we begin to look at the city of New Orleans, for example, you know, you hear the saying, always follow the money. Well, that's what we did at our center. We do some policy research as well. And what we found out may have startled some people, but it certainly is consistent with what we expected. And so a preliminary study of where all of that recovery money went basically showed us that substantially greater allocations estimated for, were, were estimated for planning districts one and two than for the other planning districts. Now, you probably can guess what one and two were, but I wanted you to just see a graph of how the, the monies were allocated with planning districts one and two getting the majority of the money. When we begin to break this down by race, which of course is always a factor in the United States, what we basically found was that there are four predominantly white or majority districts. That's one, five, 11, and 13. And there are eight majority uh, minority or African American districts, uh, two, four, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, and 12. And so when you look at the distribution of money, it looks like it's pretty even between black and white, with red being white and gold being black. Still less for blacks, but when you add to that mix that the red represents four planning districts, and the yellow represents eight planning districts, then you see how disproportionately the funds were. What you also need to know is that the majority of the storm damage were, was actually in the minor, majority black districts. So you have the districts that received the least amount of water or damage from Hurricane Katrina actually getting the majority of the money for our recovery. And so we find the downtown area, uptown towards St. Charles, um, Tulane University, those areas got the majority of the money. They have the most shops. It's like an unbelievable place. When you drive up there, you think you're in a new world. I mean, it's better than what it was before Katrina. But if you drive where I live, which is in New Orleans East, where the majority population is African American, we have one grocery store for 63,000 people. We have no shopping center. It is just horrible. We live in a food desert. And the average income is almost $59,000. So you're not talking about a poor area. You know, you always think it's all black. Oh my God, it's pitiful and poor. No, it is not. It's actually beautiful. With seven communities on man-made lakes, it's an unbelievable situation. And so you ask the question, why is it that New Orleans each, East, which is 40% of the tax district for this city, you know, without a hospital, without food stores, without all of the amenities that other communities have in our city, the only variable that's left for you to compare it to is race. It is predominantly African American. And so the race problem is still a problem in this country, although we have a black president. Um, and so there are difficult policy changes ahead that need to be made. 
the United Nations warns that an equitable distribution of the costs of climate change and benefits of a green transition will be the most difficult policy. My time is up. But green does not always mean just, so I'm going to go through the slides very quickly. Transition to a greener economy is needed, and there are a number of ways that we can do it. Clean energy, hybrid costs, energy efficient buildings, green jobs, but the transition has already begun. And you can look at what's already taken place in terms of investing in renewable energies, energy, and some countries are ahead of others. You have Quebec, Canada, and Sao Paulo, Brazil, who are actually ahead of certain predictions. You look at job creation, where the transition to renew renewable energy will create green jobs. There are 1.3 billion unemployed and underemployed people worldwide. A half billion young people will join the workforce next decade. For example, employment from renewable energy jobs in Germany is predicted to rise to between 500 and 600,000 jobs. China's renewable energy job target for 2020 is to create 800,000. So one solution would be the creation of jobs. At the center, we are involved in job creation since for the last 17 years, we've been training young people to join the green economy. It wasn't called green then, but it is now. So we're doing solar panels, weatherization, and so on in training. And we have partnerships with a number of states. And in conclusion, the worldwide transi transi transition to a low carbon resource efficient green economy must be the goal of humanity for sustainability. We must, however, ensure that with progress toward a green economy, a major priority of the transition are the previously forgotten communities to which we strive to bring equity. Thank you.